Okay, one of the things I thought I, I might just demonstrate what I was talking about earlier about if we had to come in on this reach, try to get some natural function back, natural stability, some fisheries, and some value back to the river, and at the same time decrease flood stage. If we draw the stream right now and the valley, we've got this fairly wide terrace. Then we have a trapezoidal channel. Then we have concrete bed and another terrace across to a walkway. And we have a path, a little walkway here. What we would normally do is that we would take out the concrete. The concrete goes up about 40% of the width or of the height of this bank. We would decide and determine what the normal high flow or the bank flow was. You would basically shape that down then you would put in your base flow channel and this may be then the stage of the normal high flow. Whatever that computation is, is a function of drainage area of the normal high flow. Then you make a floodplain feature. Then you slope this up and then the last feature you make is a feature that would be the flood prone area. So this is stage four, this is stage three, this is stage two, and this is stage one. So the stage one is a low flow channel. Again, this elevation you would have to set where this thaw wag is to match downstream conditions, downstream base level or elevations. You would do the same thing across, I kind of ran out of room here in my drawing, but mm -hmm. in this case, your flood stage is going to be way down for the same magnitude flood because you've taken out all of this area. This is all excavated and this is excavated to take out the concrete. In this case then your veg is now established alongside the floodplain. So you have and you can actually make a little wetlands in here on the floodplain so that this can provide some uh, wetland function back to the channel. And looking on a plan view, like right now, the stream kind of comes and makes a big, long, straight, long shot up here. And as a result, the width of the stream, you basically do a, to where the sinuosity of the stream is gonna look more like this. And the width of that stream is going to be commensurate as to the bankful discharge. That's that normal high flow in stage two. <clears throat> stage one would be a low flow channel, which would switch back and forth between outside bins. And of course, your floodplain area would be through here and then the larger big flood capacity stage four would be the furthest outside within the valley. What this would allow is a natural meandering stream with a low flow channel, a bankful channel, and then you can use native materials here for habitat and we use a lot of tow wood uh, material with sod mats over it so the tow wood uh, with sod mats on it basically is what you find in nature as opposed to riprap. This would provide time for the vegetation and the rooting depth to get extensive enough here to protect this material from erosion. So the outside of bins are used with uh, wood that's submerged that won't rot. As long as it's submerged we don't find the deterioration. And then the sod mats are the plant materials that eventually are going to be the long-term solution. And then, of course, you would seed and plant uh, a combination of vegetation, a riparian community vegetation, and a little different kind of vegetation on the terrace, which is a little drouthier, but it's not as high as the surface we're standing on now. 
but yet this can be some trees as well as grasses where you still have flood capacity. If you compare the amount of cross-sectional area of what we're looking at under existing condition versus the cross-sectional area of this particular scenario, this is much larger. You're actually increasing your Increasing the cross-sectional area. By, the, by three times. Oh yes, and then decreasing flood stage. Yeah. The good news is, is when you have high flows with the low flow channel, it keeps that sediment from filling up. And this has been a problem in a lot of these streams where a lot of the designs in river engineering has been flat bottomed trapezoidal channels. Well, they're not very efficient at moving the sediment during the high flows. And it's during the high flows that sediment builds up that is responsible for a lot of overbank flooding or loss of capacity. This design, which is Mother Nature's design, routes that sediment during the flood. So we don't increase that flood stage associated with an overwidth bottom. The other advantage of that is that you would have it the flow today would be occupied pretty much in stage one. That means it doesn't have as much surface area. <clears throat> so you're not elevating water temperatures. This is important for fisheries. It may be important for water quality issues. Uh, dissolved oxygen, for example, is going to decrease with elevated water temperatures. And again, that's a biological concern as well as biochemical oxygen demand and other things from water treatment plants that they have to look at in terms of temperature and raising of surface temperatures as a water quality parameter. This will promote lower uh, water temperatures for the same flow. It is more efficient on moving sediment, its habitat, and that's what we find in nature. So if we were to come in and try to regain the function here on the Gray's Bayou, it would be to take out the concrete, put in the meanders, put in a low flow channel, but not put the community at risk by increasing flood stage, doing just the opposite, decreasing flood stage for the same magnitude floods. And as a result, we're finding that the value that this brings back to the community, you can't hardly put a price tag on it because it's like a magnet for people to walk along a real meandering stream that has fish and has value and you have a lot more parks, a lot more open space. The other thing that we often do in situations where we've got a water quality issue for turbidity and sediment and bioremediation and problems with sewage is a lot of times what we'll do is we'll make a, if the flow is coming this way uh, to the, this channel, is we would put in a diversion structure, take part of the water out, put it into a pond and then bring that water back into the river. This pond can act as, as a wetland pond and put some surface water into it and back that would help treat the water for particulates or whatever. So we, we can do a lot of things to create off-channel habitats, uh, wetland function, water quality treatment, and again, once you have a specific uh, understanding of some of the particulates or some of the water quality issues, then part of this design gives you some options of using bioremediation and, and plants and soils to solve some of the problems that we're just creating by putting everything in a ditch. The stream Buffalo Bio is called a C5 stream type, would be the classification in a terraced alluvial valley. And so that when we look at these concreted streams that are what we call F1, uh, which would be like concreted, this should be, they should be made into these C5s. Because this is the natural stream type and it's sure functioning and it's sure enough stable. My old mind can kind of learn something now. Yeah. <laughs> if I get the right uh, teacher. Well, generally, it's like on the inside of the bend is where you normally find a floodplain, and the outside of the bend slopes up more to the terrace, but there's still a bankful bench. 
And if you look, there's a break in slope where the trees are, and then there's a break. You'll notice that break in slope is where you have the vegetation, and now you see the sand exposed. That's within the, what we call the bankful channel. And if you look back here to your right, you see the same elevation that slopes back, and that's called the floodplain. So the normal high flow, it's about like a 1.2, 1.3 year return period. Anything gets beyond that gets on the surface called a floodplain. The low terrace, it looks like about four foot higher, is a surface that's back there that's called the flood prone area, a low terrace, which is an abandoned floodplain. But this is what I was talking about earlier when we were talking about the concrete channel is that a stepped multi-stage channel is very common in natural rivers. But what it allows is to reduce that shear stress, all that energy, so that it allows the vegetation to establish to get a rooting depth and density to kind of hold things together. Just like if you look at this outside bank up here, you got sand, which is very erosive material. But if you didn't have the sycamores there with a great rooting depth and density, then that would erode towards the houses that you're seeing there. The kitchen is where we put in for a safe uh, put in. Yeah. Is to the inside of a point bar. In other words, the best place that we found for bringing people in to go ahead and put in, get in their boat, is where the velocity is lowest, where it's not an eroding surface where the vegetation is, isn't gonna, if you have to clear some veg, it's not problematic on the inside of a bin because that's a depositional area. So that's where we stage because there's generally, it's flat and there's a lot of room and it's not a high bank that would get down to the river. So it's safe, it's lower velocity. So if you have time to get in your boat and then you can paddle. Uh, well. I got interested in this because I saw too much loss, too much damage to a lot of the rivers I fished as a kid. Um, and I started seeing the reason why, and it had to do with changes in flow, changes in sediment, direct disturbance, um, a lot of activities related to land use were not done properly. And I saw great streams I fished on, the habitat was lost and pools filled. And I was not very successful in my early years of doing anything about it. And so I realized if I was going to be effective, I had to understand and then be understood. To understand, I had to have data. So I started measuring bank erosion above and below impacts, before and after, or control watersheds for reference to say, hey, this, we didn't, we didn't treat it this way, and it handled the flood. This one we treated this way, it didn't handle the flood, and it was in the same valley type, the same kind of stream. It's, it's, it's taken me about 43 years of gathering data, analyzing this data, interpreting, and trying to put the story together with enough data that I can finally teach others and demonstrate to other people that we have had an adverse effect on all these rivers. But the good news is there's a solution. We know how to better manage them. We know how to restore them. We know the rules of the river. We also understand the central tendency of rivers to want to recover. They want to be stable. We just have to know how to help them, how to direct them, and work with the river instead of against it. So over the years, I've seen so much impact that it's bothered me, and I thought, if I'm going to help rivers, I'm going to have to have enough data to explain to a lot of people what is wrong with the river, what's the cause of the impairment, what's the consequence of that impairment, so what? Well that affects a lot of people downstream in terms of sediment, in terms of fisheries, land loss, and the list goes on. The next is understanding the correction, and the correction a lot of times is just change management, how we graze different. And the last is to communicate all the three of the above. And I find that by the communication, once people understand the consequence, and we know there's a solution. I think people have a common goal, a common objective is to have good rivers, good fisheries. I just don't think we've had a common solution. And I think once we can put all of our 
science together, what we've learned over the years, and get it published and get it in people's minds. This is what we can do without having to resort to concrete and riprap and gabions and steel and the hard control of rivers. That we can come to a place like this and say, you know, this has survived the hurricanes, the big floods, and it's in an urban setting. Why? Why is it still functioning? And it has to do with the things we've talked about in terms of the different stages, the bankful bench, the vegetation influence, the function of floodplains. And this is a living, functioning river system right in the middle of Houston. What a wonderful story. And to lose such value elsewhere by clearing and by shaping into overwide trapezoidal channels with concrete, to me is a mystery how that ever got started. Because we made, remember I drew that uh, drawing of the wetlands? Yeah. Because yeah. we made deeper wetlands in the floodplain, we made a of ponds. Okay. 20 foot deep. Yeah. With an edge on them for a euphoric zone so that the plants would come in on the edge. Yeah. With the evil legs or aquatic gas and that plants. They came in uh, and into the oxbows and didn't go back in the stream. Oh my god. And yeah. they, I, they started eating the um, uh, and ceratophyllum and those species of aquatic gas and that plants. I didn't realize beaver. I see. So it's a food supply for yeah. beaver, wow. and we just build them into the floodplains to add diversity of pressure. Oh, that's fantastic. And that took care of the beaver problem. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> hey. How you doing? <laughs> uh, doing all right.